Yom Kippur, The Seven Secrets. In this video, we're going to learn seven deep and impactful secrets about this amazing Yom Tov, the most holy, most unique day on the Jewish calendar. And if you watch all the way to the end, we're actually going to have a bonus secret. In fact, there are two bonuses on this video that relate to this amazing Yom Tov. So stick with us. Shalom and welcome. I'm Rabbi Mordecai Griffin. Welcome again to our page and to our channel and to another insightful teaching. I'm glad you're here. If you're new to our channel, please click the subscribe button below and be sure and click the bell icon so that you can stay up to date on all the wonderful content that we have coming out. Your support is greatly appreciated and your involvement with our channel is a huge blessing and makes a real difference. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here. Yom Kippur, the seven secrets. This is the most unique day on the entire Jewish calendar. In fact, it's the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. It's the only day of the year that in antiquity, when the temple existed, that the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for all of Israel. We're gonna get into these seven secrets, the seven deep insights to this amazing holiday. And as I said, there's gonna be two bonuses at the end, so be sure and stick with us. Now, many people know that Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, that it's a fast day, that there are certain things that we as Jews do and more importantly don't do on this important day as we seek God to forgive us of our sins. But that's really just the surface level. That's just a minor understanding of the importance of this day. Now, I'm going to give you the scriptural references here, but for the sake of time, we're not going to read through them. I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm just going to give them to you as a resource. The first scriptural reference for Yom Kippur comes from the book of Vayikra, otherwise known as Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 26 through 32. Another source is the book of Numbers, chapter 29, verses 7 through 11. And one of the best sources is also from the book of Vayikra, that's Leviticus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 34. Now, in chapter 16 is where we find God telling us how to keep and celebrate Yom Kippur, and most importantly, how the priest is supposed to do so. But it is also the place where God tells us that this is an eternal decree. For all time, we are to celebrate Yom Kippur. Now, on Yom Kippur, there are certain things that we avoid. One of the most noted is that we, we fast, which means we have a complete fast, no food or no drink. Now, there are exceptions for nursing mothers or women who are pregnant or people who are, are ill or maybe if you have to take medication or something along those lines. There are exceptions to that rule. But generally, if you're in good health and you can do so without any harm to your body or to another person, then we fast all of the food, all the water for the entire 25-hour period. We also don't wear leather shoes. We don't bathe or wash. We don't uh, anoint ourselves with uh, perfume or lotions or makeup or any of those types of things. And we don't have marital relationships. Those are the five things that we avoid on Yom Kippur as a part of the way in which we um, in, uh, commemorate the holiday and subject ourselves, as it were, to a form of suffering, if you will, to uh, bring ourselves to teshuva. But uh, we're going to come back to that in a minute about the importance of those five things. But I want to start out with secret number one. I just got through saying that one of the most well-known things about Yom Kippur is that we're supposed to afflict ourselves. As I just said, with those five ways in which we afflict ourselves, the number one way in which we do so is to fast. Everybody knows that about Yom Kippur. It's a day of fasting and a day of prayer. But the first secret of Yom Kippur is that Yom Kippur begins with food. That's right, Yom Kippur begins with food. In order to keep the holiday of Yom Kippur, with the most uh, intense uh, uh, kedusha is to first eat. It should be noted, by the way, that Yom Kippur is the only commanded fast, and yet there's a mitzvah to enjoy a festive meal right before the fast begins. So if we turn and look at some insights to this from Cephas Amos, it gives us a real clear picture of what is so significant about eating on Yom Kippur, or I should say, just before Yom Kippur. So we read 
It says, whoever eats and drinks on the ninth of Tishrei, that's Erev Yom Kippur, Scripture considers it as if he fasted for both days, the ninth and the tenth, that is Yom Kippur itself. This comes from the Talmud, Yoma 81b. So in other words, as we're beginning Yom Kippur, right before the holiday begins, your family is supposed to have a festive meal. And when you have that festive meal, it is considered as if you have fasted the entire 25-hour period. Now, there's a reason for this. There's a deep secret as to why we eat the way we do right before the fast. And here it is. Cephas Emes brings down, he says, It is an established tradition that by eating on Erev Yom Kippur, we rectify any sins that may have arisen as a result of eating improperly. That is, eating improperly from the entire year previous. That means eating without a baraka. Maybe we ate something we forgot to pray, we forgot to say the birkat hamazon, the blessing after, after we eat, that we, God forbid, ate non-kosher food, or that we ate in an irreverent manner, we, or what have you. It says, this statement is based on the realization that food and drink can often be involved in inordinate excess and many times is the root cause of sin, as it says in Devarim 8.14, and your heart will become haughty and you will forget Adonai your God. So, they write, by focusing on the cause and seeking to elevate food and drink to a higher purpose through involvement in a mitzvah immediately prior to Teshuvah on Yom Kippur, it says we're not merely repeating, but also rectifying the very fact that led us to the sin. In other words, when we have that meal right before Yom Kippur, a day of fasting, we're actually making teshuva for all the meals that we had that year previous in which we did not truly bless God or we didn't do it with the right attitude or we didn't do it with the right prayers and so on. So right off the bat, we learn the first secret to Yom Kippur is that you have to eat. <laughs> and when you eat, you are actually making teshuva for all the times in which you didn't eat properly. Isn't that amazing? I, I guarantee you right now, there's many people watching who never in a million years would have thought that eating had something significant to do on Yom Kippur, but it does. Here's the second secret. The second secret is that Yom Kippur is a celebration of renewed covenant. That's right. What happened when we were in the wilderness, after we left Mitzrayim, after we went through the waters of the mikvah, otherwise known as the splitting of the Red Sea, God took us to Mount Sinai. Moshe went up to the top of the mountain. He brought down two uh, holy, divine uh, tablets cut from the throne of God. And as he was coming down the mountain, we unfortunately were dancing around the golden calf. And those tablets were broken because of our sin of rebellion. Later, Moses goes back up the mountain and spends another 40 days on top of that holy mountain, and God gives him a, a second set of tablets, although this time those tablets are of a lesser quality, a lesser stature. Same content, but not the same substance. Instead of being made from the throne of God, they're made from, from natural rock. Nevertheless, Moses brought those tablets down and presented them to the community on Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur becomes a day in which we celebrate new covenant, or as better said, renewed covenant. So the second secret of Yom Kippur is just that. It is a celebration of new covenant. Many people have asked me, Rabbi, as believers in Messiah Yeshua, why do we need Yom Kippur? And my answer to them is because it's a celebration of the very covenant that we have in the Messiah today. It is a celebration of rebirth and renewal. Here's the third secret. Secret number three is the renewed covenant in Yeshua renews our status and mission. I'm going to read another insight from Cephas Emes. Cephas Emex breaks down, brings down that when the first tablets were given, and they were given in full public view. Everybody saw it. In fact, the whole world saw it. And as a result, it carried with it a challenge to Israel that they should use the Torah that they're receiving, this divine Torah, to inspire the rest of mankind. Because Hashem had said to us in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus 19.5, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all peoples, for mine is the entire world. So I want you to think about something. 
when those first divine set of tablets came down, the ones that were cut from the throne of God, God intended that that should be an episode in which the whole wide world would see the Torah and that Israel would be the emissaries, the missionaries, if you will, to bring that message to the whole world. But as Cephas MS brings down, tragically we failed in that mission and the dream was dashed against the rocks. Instead of being the ones that would carry that torch, that lapid, into the world, we unfortunately, before we even had the tablets come to us, were dancing around the golden calf. So Cephas MS says, this started a spiritual erosion that may well have contributed to our entire demise. It says, as a result of the Jewish people's decline and ultimate sin, their mission was sharply redefined to focus now on internal self-improvement rather than on perfecting mankind. We became inwardly focused when we had the lesser tablets. Thank God the covenant was renewed, but now it's all about just making us Israel better and we forgot about the rest of the world. It says it follows naturally that the second tablet should have had a lower profile, therefore, reflecting on the new inward direction orientation. In other words, what Cephas and Mess is saying is that when the first tablets were given, it was given with great fanfare so that all mankind could see it. And when the second tablets were given, it was just Moses and God because it now it, he required Israel to be uplifted, not just all of mankind. Now, why is this important? Because when Yeshua restored and renewed that original covenant, he said, now go into all the world and preach this gospel, teaching the nations to obey the commandments of God. He restored not only our covenant, but our mission. That's the third secret of Yom Kippur, that at Yom Kippur, we are reinvigorated, not just to be in covenant, to, but to be Hashem Shaliachim, to go into all the world and spread this gospel. Here's the fourth secret. Secret number four is that Yom Kippur is a mikvah. Yom Kippur itself is a mikvah. Again, we go to Cephas MS. So many wonderful insights from Cephas MS. This is what he says. He brings down Yoma 8 9. He says, Rabbi Akiva said, Praiseworthy are you, O Israel, before whom you for whom do, do cleanses you. He says, who cleanses you, your father in heaven, as it says, I will cast pure waters upon you and you shall be cleansed, as it says in Ezekiel 36, 25. And he also says, the mikvah of Israel is Adonai, Jeremiah 17, 13. Just as a mikvah purifies the contaminated, so does the Holy One, blessed be he, purify Israel. So the mikvah is a pool of water that is used for spiritual purification, for conversion, family purity, preparation for the high holidays, and other things. Ultimately, Hashem is our mikvah, but Yom Kippur itself is a mikvah for Israel. As Cephas MS brings down, the analogy drawn between Adonai and the mikvah Regarding the purification of Israel, placed at the conclusion of Tractate Yoma, which deals with Yom Kippur, tells us a great deal about the nature of Yom Kippur. He writes, Consider one of the most important properties of the mikvah. To be effective, one must be totally immersed in the mikvah. That means even if you're a lady and you have long hair, every strand of your hair must go beneath the water in order for you to fully benefit from those spiritual waters. Similarly, he writes, divine service requires complete self-negation in favor of Hashem. This laudable objective is primarily achieved by the Jewish soul upon its departure from the body and the hereafter. However, okay, however, how do we have total self-negation without dying? How do we have total self-negation right now? And the answer to that is Yom Kippur. When we set all of our material desires and needs aside, we're not bathing, we're not putting on makeup, we're not in, enjoying uh, marital relationships, we're not putting on leather shoes, we're dressing in all white. We are, we are subjugating our soul to God. And as a result, we are completely and totally immersing in Him. And as a result, receiving that mikvah-like atonement in our life. But wait, as they say, there is more. Not only are we a mikvah, 
or excuse me, not only is Hashem a mikvah, but we become a mikvah as well. We become the pool that holds the water of Torah. This is what it says. Yom Kippur had already been designated as a day on which Israel becomes a receptacle of Torah. As the Zohar, sta so Zohar states, Hashem and the Torah are one. So when we immerse in Hashem, He, in effect, immerses us. In other words, when we go into the waters of Hashem, which is the Torah, He fills us up with His Torah. So you and I leave Yom Kippur as holy mikvot filled to the brim of God's holy word, ready to be able to immerse others in it. Now you might be asking yourself, where in the world is that in the idea of Yeshua? And the answer is John chapter 7, 37 through 38, where Yeshua says, on the last and greatest day of the feast of Sukkot, Yeshua stood up and cried out in a loud voice and said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You and I, my friends, when we come to Yom Kippur, we are becoming a mikvah. We are diving into a mikvah. Now, it gets even better than that. In Tehillim 27.1, Tehillim, the part, uh, Psalm Tehillim, or Tehillim means Psalm, excuse me. Tehillim 27, we read during this time. In the first verse, it says, Hashem is my light, Ori, and my salvation, Yishi. Now, many commentators say that Rosh Hashanah is the my light of that verse, and Yom Kippur is the my salvation of that verse. Now, stick with me for a second. The Midrash brings down that the Exodus is my light and the Red Sea is, is, uh, is my salvation. How does this correlate? Well, on Rosh Hashanah, it says that Yosef was let out of prison and brought before Pharaoh, and he soon became the viceroy of Egypt. When that happened, that's when uh, the Exodus began for the Jewish people. So Rosh Hashanah does in fact represent the Exodus, which represents the light. That's when the light started to dawn. And the Red Sea does in fact represent the mikvah. Even Kepha brought this down and said that we, we've all passed through the sea. Paul said the same thing. And therefore Yom Kippur, which is a mikvah, also represents my salvation because as the sages have said, the Exodus represents Messiah ben Yosef, that is Joseph who suffered for our sins, and the Red Sea represents Messiah ben David, the final redemption. So when we come to the High Holy Days, we're actually celebrating so many things, and one of them is the two Messiahs. When we come to Rosh Hashanah, we are celebrating Messiah ben Yosef who suffered and died for our sins. That's why we talk about the Akidah on Rosh Hashanah. And then when we come to Yom Kippur, we're celebrating Messiah ben David, who is my salvation, who is going to lead us into the final redemption, maybe soon in our time, which is one of the reasons why we talk about Jonah during that holiday. Secret number five, Yom Kippur needs the Zadik. The uh, book of, uh, of Hinuch teaches us a very viable lesson about Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur has a great deal of power for atonement, but in order to achieve the fullest atonement, it requires a Zadik. So let's just read a couple of lines from the Sefer Hinuk. It says that God, by His grace, gave us Yom Kippur. Why? Because He knew that if the man's sins were allowed to accumulate year after year after year without there being any opportunity for them to wipe the slate clean and start over, it would just be too much. Humanity couldn't handle it. So God in His grace gave us a, uh, well, we have all year long to make teshuva, but this is a unique period of teshuva. He gave us a special day where we can come and get completely immersed and purified. So it says, and Yom Kippur atones, which is to say, that the day itself has a degree of power in effecting the atonement for sins that are relatively minor. Now in the footnotes, it brings down a Gemara from Yoma 86a. And it says, this teaches that there are four levels of sins vis-a-vis -vis the requirements for atonement. Number one, the for a violation of a mitzvah obligation, repentance alone wipes away the sin. Number two, for in transgression of a mitzvah prohibition, Full atonement is achieved through repentance coupled with the power of Yom Kippur. So for the first two sins, repentance 
and or repentance in Yom Kippur, we're okay. If we had a mitzvah obligation, we failed to do it, we can just say, Hashem, I'm sorry, I'll do better next time. And Hashem says, Buk Hashem. If we have something we did, did, uh, did what we were supposed to, weren't supposed to do, Hashem says, you need teshuva, but you also need Yom Kippur. So that's good, but now we run into a problem. The next two sins, Yom Kippur doesn't atone for, and repentance doesn't atone for, we need the Zadik, and here it is. For a violation of a mitzvah that carries the penalty of kares, or excision, or capital punishment, repentance and Yom Kippur serve to ward off punishment, but one must also serve, suffer affliction. So in other words, it just kicks the can down the road, but it doesn't actually wipe the slate clean. And fourthly, desecration of Hashem's name is fully forgiven only upon the demise of the person. In other words, only at our death. So my friends, we see here that if we want full forgiveness, we require the death of the Zadik coupled with our Teshuvah, coupled with Yom Kippur to bring about the full forgiveness that we require. Now, to highlight that, I'm gonna turn now to the uh, Midrash Tankuma and share a couple of thoughts related to the atonement of the Zadik. So this comes from Midrash Tankuma, Vayikra Akarimot. And this is what it says. Rabbi Abba Bar Avina said, why does the death of Miriam juxtapose the section dealing with the ashes of the red heifer? This teaches us that just as the ashes of the red heifer atone for sin, so too does the death of Miriam act as an atonement. Now, it says next, Aaron's sons died on the first of Nisan. Why then is their death mentioned in Yom Kippur? In Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about the death of Aaron's sons. So the, the, the sages are asking the question, why is the death of Aaron's sons, priests, mentioned along with Yom Kippur? And here's the answer. This teaches that just as Yom Kippur serves as atonement for sins, so too does their deaths act as an atonement. And finally, it says, where do we learn that the death of the righteous provide atonement? For it is stated, they buried the bones of Shaul and his son Yonatan in the land of Benjamin in Zaila, and the grave of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded, and God answered the prayers of their land after that. So we find here in the ancient writings that the death of the Zadok brings atonement, and thereby we can understand now why Yeshua, who is the Zadok above all Zadokim, can provide that atonement necessary to couple with our teshuva and our Yom Kippur to bring about all the atonement that we need. I don't know about you, my friends, but I can say that there's been times in my life where I've committed sins that require the death penalty. And there have been times in my life where I've committed sins, unfortunately, that have desecrated God's name. And so I need that Zadik coupled with my teshuva and Yom Kippur to bring about the full redemption. And I pray that you join me in that. Secret number six, Hashem takes back the adulterous wife. Now this is a very important insight because people ask me all the time, they say, doesn't the Torah say you're not allowed to take back a, a bride that you have divorced? So how can div Hashem divorce us and then take us back? And they have real problems with that. Well, through the power of Teshuvah and Yom Kippur, God takes back his divorced bride. This comes again from the Talmud, Yoma 86b. Rabbi Yonan said, great is repentance as it overrides even prohibitions of the Torah. How so? Oh, did you hear that? That great is repentance because it overrides even a prohibition of the Torah. How so? As it says that God said, saying, if a man sends away his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, may he return to her again? Will not that land be greatly polluted? But you have committed adultery with many lovers, and would you yet return to me, says the Lord, Jeremiah 3.1. Indeed, the Torah states, her former husband who sent her away may not take her back again to be his wife after she's been made impure, Deuteronomy 24.4. The relationship between the Jewish people, it says in the Talmud, and the Holy One, blessed be he, is compared to that between a husband and a wife. Just as it is prohibited for an adulterous wife to return to her husband, it should be prohibited for the Jewish people to return to God after their sins. 
yet repentance overrides this prohibition. The sixth secret of Yom Kippur is that it eliminates, it tears up that get, that written code of divorce against us and allows us to remarry our husband, as it were. Now, how is this made possible? I just mentioned the uh, Zodic, and there might be somebody watching who says, okay, that's the Zodic, but how do you tie this back to Yeshua? Uh, there's been many Zodics. Well, I'm glad you asked that. So it says, how does this happen? It says, one man's teshuva can save the world. It was taught in Ebrasia that Rabbi Mir would say, great is repentance because the entire world is forgiven on account of one individual who repents. As it says, I will hear the heal their backsliding and I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from him. Hosea 14, 5. It does not say from them, but it says from the sinners, or I'm sorry, it does not say from them, but it says from him. That is from the individual. Because he repented, everyone will be healed. It uses a singular form. So by the teshuva of one man, the whole world could be saved. Secret number seven. The Kohen Gadol had to relate to us in order for the mitzvah of atonement to be effective. It was a requirement that the Kohen Gadol had to be on our level. He had to walk in. I want you to think about this. The holiest man on the planet at the time, walking into the holiest place at the holiest time of the year, had to do so only being able to relate to us. Otherwise, his atonement was ineffectual. This idea is expressed in the book Orchards of Delights by Rabbi Trugman, who writes, he says, this idea is expressed in Pirkei Avot 2.5. Do not judge your fellow man until you have been in his position. As we discussed earlier, the importance of empathy also explains, at least on a superficial level, why Aaron had to go the humiliating experience of being partly responsible for the golden calf. Aaron, who was to be the high priest, needed to experience this sense of sin to some degree so that he would be able to truly relate to those who he was going to, to make atonement for at the tabernacle. The Baal Shem Tov made this one of his central ideas when he said that he taught that in order to evaluate others, one must risk lowering oneself to their level. In taking this mission upon oneself, the righteous individual endeavors to redeem all the fallen sparks and fulfill the Jewish people's very purpose in the world. So Yeshua, some people say, why did Yeshua have to come and manifest in a human form? Because in order to effectual, or to be effectual in our atonement in the original tabernacle, he had to be able to know what it was like to be tempted with sin, to suffer as we suffer. He had to come on our level in order to raise us up. Rabbi Shmuel, who was the fourth Rebbe of Chabad, he used to change into the clothing that people were wearing that were coming to him for counseling. And he used to do this because he wanted to understand the situation of those that he needed to counsel. And he did that by dressing like they dressed. He became like them so that he would know how to minister to them. Now it says in the letter to the Hebrews, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua ben Elohim, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who had been tempted in all ways yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. There's a famous dictum in Judaism that says, in the place where the Baal Tshuva stands, that's the one who's come to repent, that even the totally righteous cannot stand. Barakot 34b. There's a comment to that and it says, all year long, even on Shabbat and Yom Tov, the Kohen Gadol may not enter the Holy of Holies. Only on Yom Kippur, representing the penitents, those who return to Hashem. It's that, at that point that he merits to stand in the place where only they can stand. Only the truly penitent can stand in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest had to lower himself to know what that was like so that he could stand in their place for them. 
Wow, that's all seven. But wait, we have a bonus. Okay, we have two bonuses. So here's the first bonus. You're coming to Yom Kippur, you're wondering, I don't understand exactly, but I know that this is what God wants. So I've heard all those seven and they're amazing, but, but what else is there? And here it is. Yom Kippur is a season of grafting and regrafting. It says <clears throat> in one of the comments of Yom Kippur, it says, let the Jew, however, deny any of the three indispensable ingredients of his attachment to God, that is his basic faith, Torah, or even the covenant, and he is no longer a part of the unit. He's no longer a part of the unit. If you're a Jew and you don't have faith, Torah and covenant, all three, not one, but all three, then you're no longer a part of the nation. You are no, you're, you've been broken off. This is a Jewish idea. It says he has severed fruit and no matter how healthy he, he may be, he is doomed. When that happens, according to the rabbis, Yom Kippur itself cannot automatically give atonement. But even there, there's hope. Teshuva. Teshuva is the Jew's return to his source, his reunification with his creator. And this is what the comment says. He regrafts himself to the tree of life and atonement becomes his reward. So the bonus for Yom Kippur for us is that we, we get to be grafted or regrafted depending on where you're coming from. The point is, is we're all broken branches and on Yom Kippur, this is a time that we get to come back to the tree of life and be grafted back in and bear fruit. And here's the second bonus. I mentioned earlier when we first started the five things that we do to commemorate this time, the, the five prohibitions. And there's an insight that talks about the fact that these five prohibitions correspond to our senses. Here's the insight. It says that on the day of Yom Kippur, we are restricted from anointing ourselves, from eating and drinking, from wearing leather shoes, uh, from bathing or washing, and from marital relationships. But in fact, we're encouraged to smell pleasant fragrances. It's actually considered a mitzvah to anoint the shul with spices and have good fragrance in the shul. Why? It says a reading of the third chapter of Genesis will show that there were only four of the five senses that we use when mankind fell. It says that when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, it says, and the woman saw, that's the sense of sight, and she took its fruit, the sense of touch, and she ate the sense of taste, and they heard the sense of hearing. However, it says, the sense of smell is not mentioned in that passage, for it is this reason, the sense of smell remains a spiritual pleasure on Yom Kippur, according to Talmud Barakot 43b. So we're able to enjoy the sense of smell on Yom Kippur because we didn't sin with the sense of smell, which is why the sages say that when Messiah returns, he's going to judge us, not on how we look, not on how we feel, but on how we smell. He's gonna judge us with the sense of smell because that's the only sense that was not corrupted. May you smell the beautiful spices on Yom Kippur and may all the secrets of this wonderful holiday be yours. I wish you all the best. May you be inscribed and sealed for a good life, for holiness, and for atonement and the merit of Messiah Yeshua. Thank you so much for joining us today.